Fortnite Season 4 holds a special place in my heart. This was the season when I personally started playing the game, and as you can guess, I have a lot of nostalgia for it. As a kid who only owned Nintendo consoles, this game really introduced me to the genre of shooters and really broadened my horizon in games. The cartoony style, easy to learn gameplay, and fun multiplayer that worked with my crappy internet was something new and distinct that got me instantly hooked, even still 5 years later. Which has led me to now where I'm creating this retrospective to share with people the history of Season 4 and my opinions relating to it. Before I begin, I have a playlist I'll put in the description that has my other videos I've done on the seasons previous to this one if you would like to check it out before or after watching this one. But enough personal advertisement, time to get started. On May 1st, 2018, version 4.0 released, bringing the Season 4 update. First things first, let's take a look at the battle pass for this season. This season was superhero themed, so of course the pass was as well. New to the battle pass this season is sprays. A new type of cosmetic. In game, you can spray paint these images onto pretty much any surface. These really weren't anything too notable and were pretty much there as a filler item like emoticons that didn't take too much effort to create and could fill up spots in the battle pass easily. Even then, the battle pass still had some cool cosmetics and emotes too. Most notably, Orange Shirt Kid finally got his emote put into the game. But the skins this season were just alright. Most of them were just pretty basic and forgettable, making a not so great battle pass in my opinion. The first skin in the pass was Carbite, an okay looking superhero skin. Another new feature this battle pass brought was selectable styles. For Carbite, leveling up to certain milestones would progressively upgrade his suit, but most of these edit styles that had half armor just ended up looking really bulky and stupid looking. But when fully upgraded at level 65, Carbite was a pretty good looking skin. The second skin in the battle pass was Battlehawk, just a basic military skin, but with an eye patch. Ooh. The next skin was Technique, a street artist. Probably one of the better looking skins in the battle pass. Another skin in the battle pass was Zoe. The next skin in the battle pass was Valor. Bonus points for staying on theme, but she's pretty much just Wonder Woman, but eh. The next skin was Squad Leader, yet another basic military skin. He doesn't even have a cool eye patch either. Lastly, for tier 100 was Omega. Much like Carbite, he was a superhero skin that had progressive styles that are earned by leveling up. And also like Carbite, he looks awful until he's fully upgraded. But when you hit level 80 and get full armor, that's when he starts to look snazzy, like a real tier 100 skin. But back in season 4, leveling up was quite difficult, so getting to level 80 was quite a feat that not many were able to achieve. To top it off, upgrading Carbite and Omega was restricted to just this season, so not many people were able to fully upgrade their skins, which kinda sucks. This season also started the trend of secret skins. The secret skin could be earned later in the season by doing weekly challenges, as well as loading screens being earned by these weekly challenges as well. But I'll get more into that in a bit. Overall, Season 4's Battle Pass definitely wasn't my favorite. This pass just wasn't memorable and the only skins people talk about are Carbite and Omega. I mean, who the hell cares about Valor? But now that I'm done talking about the battle pass, now we can get into the map changes for this season. If you remember from last season, a giant freaking space rock is about to hit the island. Now that it's season 4, let's see where it hit. Please tilt it, please tilt it, please tilt it, son of a bitch! As you can see by the big noticeable hole on the map, instead of hitting tilted as everyone anticipated, the main impact struck the center of the map taking out some factors and most of Dusty Depot. About a warehouse and a half is left, and what remains is a giant crater and the new POI, Dusty Divot. In the crater, a research lab has started to be constructed around the meteor. It also may just be a coincidence, but it does resemble the research lab in Thor. But that might be a stretch. Dusty Divot wasn't too crazy of a location, but provided well-needed cover because the entirety of the crater was completely barren besides Hop Rocks, which I'll get more into that later. The giant crater was visually impressive, but in a gameplay sense, it wasn't too great. The main problem being the complete open area which made you a sitting duck. From going from an area that had very little cover to now where there is none at all, it isn't a very good improvement. Especially with the terrain, moving about is made much more tedious. But other than that, the crater was a cool new addition to the map that changed up the game a bit. And the meter at Dusty Divot wasn't the only impact on the island. Rocks were scattered around the area from impact, and one even landed in Loot Lake. Not only this, but a lot more meteorite shards landed across the map, leaving craters as well. One meteorite hit the hotel, ripping a hole through the sign, flipping an RV, and leaving a very small crater in the parking lot. 
another meteorite landed east of Dong Junction, one meteorite hit northeast of Snobby Shores, and another just a little west of Fatal Fields. East of Retail Row, just by the racetrack, another meteorite landed. The prison got hit directly in the center with the meteorite, and even an office building in Tilted Towers wasn't safe, as it was completely pummeled by a meteor. Lastly, a meteor hit the new location Risky Reels, which was located just northwest of Wailing Woods. This place was a drive-in movie theater that got completely rocked by a meteor shard. It ripped right through the movie screen and landed directly in the center of the lot, scattering flip cars everywhere. The area is now starting to be cleaned up by the... um... We'll just call this faction the government for now. Another thing of interest in this area is the sign. It displayed three different movies, that of which being Revenge of Bree's Dog Part 2, It Came From Moisty Mire, and What Is It? An Ant Story. These movies would get cycled out almost every update, and even in some instances, gave some hints toward the lore. Risky Reels is definitely one of the best PYs that has ever been added to the game in my opinion. It had pretty decent loot, buildings around the area, and an abundance of cars that were good for cover and gunfights and great for gathering metal. Definitely one of the most memorable Fortnite locations to date. But besides the meteor impacts, there were quite a few other map changes to cover as well. The industrial area by Flush Factory had a few buildings removed, to now include a large nightclub and a parking lot. East of Junk Junction, a movie set had been constructed that also had a large warehouse. And over at Moisty Mire, another one was set up, making the swamp a little less desolate. Also, a war has been waged against the heroes and the villains that isn't related to the movie sets whatsoever. Probably. South of Lonely Lodge, a large mansion was added to the edge of the map. While it may just look like where any rich Joe might live, hidden underground was a secret base. This underground structure was the main base for the superheroes. They also had another hidden base under the Blue House and Salty Springs as well. And on the other side of the map, on a mountain east of Snobby Shores, a base had been set up for the villains. While it had a secret entrance through a shed on the top of the mountain, it was a little bit more noticeable than the hero's base due to the backside of the base being in the shape of an evil face. It was a pretty large base and even had a freaking missile. But I believe that's all for the map changes, so now we can get into the loot pool. Just about every item returned from Season 3, but I'll give you a rundown for what remains in the loot pool. For Season 4, items that return include the Assault Rifle, Burst Assault Rifle, Assault Rifle with Scope, Light Machine Gun, Pump Shotgun, Tactical Shotgun, Heavy Shotgun, Tactical Submachine Gun, Suppressed Submachine Gun, Mini Gun, Pistol, Revolver, Suppressed Pistol, Hand Cannon, Full Action Sniper Rifle, Semi-Automatic Sniper Rifle, Hunting Rifle, Grenade Launcher, Rocket Launcher, Grenade, Bush, Boogie Bomb, Impulse Grenade, Remote Explosives, Port of Fort, Clinger, Bandages, Med Kit, Shield Potion, Slurp Juice, Small Shield Potion, Chug Jug, Damage Trap, Launch Pad, and Cozy Campfire. Holy crap, this list is starting to get long. The only item that was removed this season was the crossbow. And this season, the only new item we got was Hop Rocks. These were the first forgeable items to be added to the game, and could only be found at Dusty Divot, and all the other areas on the map that got struck by a meteor I mentioned earlier. They could not be stored in your inventory and took one second to use. When consumed, they gave a low gravity effect that made you floatier and jump higher. This state would also negate fall damage, but the effect would only last for 30 seconds. Hop rocks were definitely a fun movement item, but were made much worse because they couldn't be carried. But, going to a specific location to access them was definitely worth the trouble. This season's victory umbrella was the wet paint. The regular umbrella, but heavily graffiti. I mean, it's alright looking, but I think something more hero themed would be preferable. There was a new lobby background showing off one of the crash sites as well. And also, remember those weekly loading screens I mentioned earlier? Well, here's the first one showing the behind the scenes of the making of It Came From Moisty Mire, one of the movies that can be seen on the sign at Risky Reels. But I think that about covers it for the start of the season. Although the loot pool lacks new items, the map changes more than make up for it. Two new POIs plus dozens of small changes. I would say that Season 4 started off pretty well. On May 8th, version 4.1 arrived bringing a massive collaboration to the game. But first, let's look at the map changes for this update. At Dusty Divot, construction of the research lab has finished and the main building now has a roof. And over at Wailing Woods, a mysterious bunker has appeared. It was unable to be opened and quickly became shrouded in mystery. Is this a secret bunker for the government? Another base for the heroes or the villains? Or maybe something else? 
This became one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of the game and seemed to be added with little to no reasoning. But that's it for this update to map changes, so now we can get into the most important part. Fortnite and Marvel collaborated to bring the Infinity Gauntlet LTM for the release of Avengers Infinity War. For Fortnite's first collab to be something as huge as Marvel is just mind blowing. Especially back then when the movies weren't unwatchable pieces of shit. So having this collab was massive for the game. But what even was this LTM? The Infinity Gauntlet LTM was just regular Battle Royale, except that around the middle of the match, the Infinity Gauntlet would fall from the sky and when picked up, the player would turn into Thanos. When the Gauntlet is picked up, the player would be turned into Thanos and would be transported into the sky where he can then freefall back down. As Thanos, you would drop all of your loot and would be unable to build and use weapons, but instead had three abilities. First of which was a punch. It did 80 damage and could destroy any structure. Not only that, but if it was performed in the air, Thanos could do a ground pound doing the same effects as the punch, but now applying a knockback effect as well. His second ability was a laser beam. This laser would last 5 seconds and did 15 damage per hit. This thing had a stupid high fire rate, so if you can aim well, you could shred through someone in not even a second. The one downside of this laser being that it was harder to use at longer ranges. The last ability of Thanos' toolkit was a jump. It would take 3 seconds to charge and when performed, Thanos would launch into the sky. The punch and laser ability could also be comboed with this to be used in midair, and Thanos was unable to take fall damage. As Thanos, you would have 700 health and 300 shield. When Thanos gets an elimination, his shield would instantly recharge, so there was a way to heal shield but not health. If Thanos was defeated, he would drop the gauntlet, but if it wasn't picked up after a short while, it would respawn and fall from the sky again. This game mode was really fun, but Thanos was crazy overpowered, so one person could completely wipe the floor with everyone. Thanos was stupid strong, but he did have a weakness, being that he was slow and bad at long range, so as long as you kept your distance, you were able to stand a chance. And remember, this was base battle royale, so everyone was against each other. But because becoming Thanos was so sought after, everyone just ended up teaming up on him to take him out so then they could get a chance to play as him. Later that day, a hotfix patch came through, which balanced Thanos just a little bit. His shield was reduced from 300 to 200, and his health was increased from 700 to 800. The laser damage also got reduced, going from 15 to 12. This update definitely nerfed him a bit, and made it easier to take out his space health before he recharged his shield. But that's it for the LTM. To sum it up, the Infinity Gauntlet LTM was just a one against all against Purple Guy, and would last until May 15th. This day as well, the second set of weekly challenges came out, which means another loading screen. And it seems that the meteor that hit the prison has let Omega escape, and now he's back for vengeance. On May 10th, some more balance changes were brought to the Infinity Gauntlet LTM. Thanos' laser damage was increased from 12 to 20, punch damage increased from 80 to 100, and health decreased from 800 to 500. He became sort of a glass cannon. Playing as Thanos now allowed you to obliterate people even faster, while in return making it much easier to be taken out so that more people get a chance to play as him. A win-win if you ask me. Also, the next day on May 11th, 50v50v2 50 50 returned and would last until May 30th. On May 15th, the third loading screen dropped, but there wasn't too much info, just the heroes playing out their attack against Omega. A day later on May 16th, version 4.2 released bringing one of the most game-changing items of the game. Apples. It, it was just apples. These were forageable items similar to the Hop Rocks. They could be found on the ground underneath certain trees, and were unable to be stored in the inventory. They would take 1 second to use, and would then heal 5 health. So, nothing too crazy. This update got Burst Assault Rifle enjoyers such as myself rejoicing as an epic and legendary version was added. This was great, because now the regular assault rifle now has some competition at higher rarities. But similarly to the assault rifle, it sports a different weapon model than the lower rarity variants. A couple of items got some balance changes in this update as well. The suppressed submachine gun got a damage buff of 3 damage for each rarity. Previously, its damage was just one higher than the tactical submachine gun and had a lower fire rate so this made the suppressed submachine gun a much better pick. The other item that got changed was the damage trap. It got a massive damage nerf of 50 damage. It also had its reload time reduced from 6 seconds to 5 seconds. 
The damage trap, which now did 75 damage, was practically useless. To eliminate someone with full shield would now take three traps. A little ridiculous if you ask me. But now, time to get into the map changes. Excavation of the meteor at Dusty Divot has started, and it has revealed a glowing metal object deep inside the meteor. Over at Tilted Towers, the crater caused by the meteor has been completely filled in. And at Risky Reels, the movie selection has been refreshed, and now plays Carbide Returns, Valor Origins, and Omega's Revenge. Pretty much indicating that the Heroes vs. Villains is just a movie plot, instead of the storyline. And finally, at Retail Row, a Fork Knife food truck has appeared. Get it, cause fork knife, fortnite, ha 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 ha. The next day, on May 17th, the first semblance of a competitive mode was added, being the Solo Showdown LTM. This mode was just the basic battle royale with a point system. Only 50 matches could be played, and the top 100 winners would receive V-Bucks. Anyone who played all 50 matches would also receive a free spray as well. This was really just a testing ground to see how well Fortnite would work as an eSport, and to see player engagement from a competitive event as well. This LTM would last until May 21st. On May 22nd, a content update occurred which gave us the jetpack. Wait a minute, that's not that jetpack. Instead, the Eye of the Storm tracker was mistakenly enabled for a few hours. It came in a rare rarity and when picked up, it would be worn on your back and replace your back bling if you had one on. It would take up a slot in your inventory, but would allow you to see the next storm circle on your map, as long as you had it equipped. This thing wasn't finished so it didn't have a proper model and just used Rose Team Leader's backlink, which hadn't even been released at the time. The Eye of the Storm Tracker would have been a really overpowered item, so once it got removed, it never came back. Once the Eye of the Storm Tracker was disabled, the jetpack was released. It came in a legendary rarity, and like the Eye of the Storm Tracker, it would be worn on your back and replace your back bling. It could be used by holding the jumper aim button and would propel you into the sky. When using it, it would have a limited amount of energy before you had to come back to the ground and recharge it. And if you used all of the energy while in the air, it would have a slight delay before recharging. Not only that, but the jetpack had a limited amount of fuel, and when it was depleted, it would be destroyed. Only one of these could be kept in your inventory at a time, and while flying in the air, you can't aim weapons. But still, the jetpack was a really fun mobility item. You could get high ground, stop yourself from taking fall damage, etc. It was too bad though that it was a limited time item that would be vaulted at a later date. Today, Solid Gold V2 came out as well and had its loophole updated. The Burst Assault Rifle, Heavy Shotgun, and Jetpack were added, and the Guided Missile was removed. Solid Gold would last only a couple of days, and would be removed on May 25th. The fourth loading screen also released, showing Omega with an army of robots now ready to fight the heroes. On May 25th, we actually got a new LTM. Close Encounters. The only items in this mode were shotguns and jetpacks. It also had a faster storm similar to the Blitz. Sounds pretty fun, but too bad it got disabled right after it came out. So, Solid Gold got re-enabled while it got fixed. When it came back later that day, it got disabled a few hours later because of a massive oversight. In this mode, there were only shotguns which had no range, and jetpacks which could save you from ball damage. This became a perfect breeding ground for sky basing, which no one could stop with shotguns. So, Solid Gold ended up staying for the rest of Close Encounters time until the next update on May 30th. On May 29th, the fifth loading screen released, showing the conclusion of the Hero vs. Villain arc where the team of heroes is having their final showdown with Omega and his team of robots. The next day on May 30th, version 4.3 was released with a new mushroom item. Yet another forageable item that can't be kept in the inventory. They could be found on the ground in dark shady areas like Wailing Woods. They would take one second to consume and would give 5 shield. But the real star of the update was the addition of shopping carts, my all-time favorite item to be ever added to the game. Back in Chapter 1, Epic didn't really want to add basic vehicles to the game like cars and boats, because that would take away from the goofiness, so they had to get creative. In doing so, they created the shopping cart, but calling it a vehicle might be an overstatement. 
The shopping cart could be found across the map and had two seats and 400 health. One seat would allow you to control the cart, you could push it to go faster and hang off to maintain speed. The other seat would allow you to sit in the cart and shoot, build, emo, etc. You could change your seat at any time and pull off sweet drive-bys or came up with a buddy for some silly shenanigans. As it was physics-based, going downhill would gain a lot of speed, but you had to be careful because it didn't stop fall damage. The shopping cart definitely wasn't perfect though. It was hella glitchy on release. Flying into the sky, falling out of the map, and killing the entire lobby, just to name a few. To many people, the shopping cart is completely useless, but to me, it is one of the most fun items to ever be added to the game with all the stupid crap you can do with it. In addition to the best item in the game, there was a plethora of map changes this update as well. At Dusty Divot, vegetation was starting to grow in the crater, which helped in not making you as much as a moving target when going there. Inside the main lab, the extraction of the meteor has been furthered and it looks like the metal object inside is actually a space pot. At Tilted Towers, the hop rocks from the crater have been packed up into a convoy of trucks that have left and have now arrived at the indoor soccer field. But where was the government taking them and why? Over at Risky Reels, the crater is starting to be patched up and there is a new selection of movies. Dusty Impact, The Hills Are Haunted, and The Cabin in Wailing Woods. At the crater by Pleasant Park, the truck that had been packing up the hop rocks has been flipped over and cleaned out from what most likely was a heist. And lastly, posters of Carbide and Omega have appeared across the island, further confirming that the superhero storyline is just a film. This update also brought back two LTMs, first of which is Blitz V2 which had an updated loot pool, faster storms, more loot, and the battle bus was lowered to the ground. The other LTM being Teams of 20 V2, which now has a bus for each team. Both of these LTMs would last until June 11th. On May 31st, a small patch had released, which fixed some shopping cart bugs, but definitely not all of them. And a day later on June 1st, the Blitz Showdown LTM was released. It was just like the solo showdown LTM that happened previously, but this time it's in Blitz, and only 25 matches can be played in total. Blitz showdown would only stay a couple of days until June 4th. On June 5th, a content update dropped bringing in the new bouncer trap. These came in a rare rarity and were an upgraded version of the blue directional jump pad, but could be placed on walls, floors, and ceilings. When a player makes contact with it, it will bounce them in the opposite direction it is facing. Not only this, but you would be given the low gravity effect like hop rocks for a few seconds. While airborne, you would be able to aim weapons so it was also very practical for trick shots. Bouncers were a pretty decent trap for movement as well, and made for a much needed replacement for the directional jump pad. The content update also brought some balance changes too. The pump shotgun got a huge damage nerf of 10 for each rarity and it and the tactical shotgun had its headshot multiplier reduced from 2.5 to 2. Now, no shotgun was able to one-shot people, and the closest thing being the heavy shotgun which did a 193 headshot. Prior to this, the shotguns were probably the most powerful guns in the game, so I'd say the nerf to the shotgun meta was necessary. But it still didn't make the heavy shotgun good though. But what did get improved was the damage trap. It got its damage doubled, being increased from what it had before the nerf. The damage trap was now actually useful again and even better than before. On June 7th, the 6th loading screen had been released, putting the final nail in the coffin that the main storyline of the season was just a red herring. A few days later, on June 11th, version 4.4 released bringing the Thermal Scope Assault Rifle. It used medium ammo and came in an epic and legendary rarity. This weapon worked almost identically to the Scope AR, but with different stats and thermal vision, obviously. Compared to its base variant, it had higher damage and a much slower fire rate and reduced magazine size. The thermal was great for scoping out where enemies were and tagging a few shots while you were at it.
In this update, the assault rifle the scope's name was changed to scope assault rifle to fit in more of the thermal version's name, and it just rolls off the tongue much better. Bouncers can now be placed on ramps, which made them even better for mobility, and the jetpack has been vaulted, as well as the shopping cart being disabled because people were still finding ways to get under the map. But now we can look at this update's map changes. At Dusty Divot, more trees and grass is growing in the crater, and the excavation of the meteor at the research base has concluded. Whatever was in that space pod has now escaped, and is somewhere on the island. Near Junk Junction, a massive outdoor soccer stadium has appeared, in the place of the ruins of the destroyed suburb. Most likely in collaboration with the Soccer World Cup organization thing. I really do not care and I'm not going to look up the name of it. In addition to the behemoth of the stadium, many locations now have makeshift soccer pitches. At Tilted Towers, a wrecking ball is demolishing the rest of the building that was destroyed by the meteor, and the Hop Rock Convoy has left the outdoor soccer stadium and has now arrived at Snobby Shores. The crater at Risky Reels is now fully patched up, and a convoy of trucks is now transporting the hop rocks there, and now have arrived at Anarchy Acres. In addition, the movies at Risky Reels have been refreshed, and now play The Beautiful Game, Nothing But Net, and Mirror of Lies. The crater at the prison is now starting to be filled, as well as the crater at Fatal Fields, which is where a third convoy has left and is now making its way to a bridge nearby. All of these convoys seem to be heading west, and are most likely going to the villain base. But why? Hop rocks and meteor fragments have been brought there, so maybe the government is having a secret research project there, or maybe the alien from the space pod has taken refuge at the base. And the most important map change being this random mountain north of the indoor soccer stadium that now has ramps and shopping carts. I like to call this place Shopping Cart Mountain, and it was my favorite drop spot for the entirety of Chapter 1. Just grabbing a shopping cart here, crossing Loot Lake, and going into the Tilted just to get shot at was how I enjoyed playing the game. The LTMs for this update were Sniper Shootout V3 and 50v50 V3. For Sniper Shootout, the crossbow had been removed and both the scoped AR and thermal AR were added. They literally have Assault Rifle in the name. Did they not learn from adding revolvers? I get that they wanted to show off the new weapon, but come on. 50v50 also returned, but only had a few minor changes, and both of these LTMs would stay until June the 19th. On June 19th, Fortnite was released on the Switch, and this is how I personally got into the game. I remember one day at the lunch table, a friend recommending it to me, telling me about the building mechanics, tilted towers, and people tree camping. It was free, so I got the game the next day to figure out what the hell tilted towers was. And on the first match, I landed at the underground tunnel and immediately got blasted in the head with a shotgun. I was hooked. Being a kid with just a Switch at the time, this game was completely different to anything I was playing. I hadn't really played too many shooters beforehand, so I was pretty terrible, but it was one of the only good online games on the Switch that I could play with my friends who had different consoles, even if it looked and ran like crap on the Switch. Which has led me to where I am today, still playing this wretched game 5 years later. But enough about my personal experience though, let's get into the rest of Season 4. On June 14th, shopping carts returned, but were still buggy and Sniper Shootout got some changes. The scoped assault rifle had been removed, and the chance of finding a thermal one was reduced. Still not solving the problem, but making it a little more tolerable. This day, the secret sin became available, which was the visitor. He was revealed to be the one who came out of the pod, and was one of the seven, whatever that means. He was the one who brought the hop rocks and meteor fragments to the villain base, and seems to be getting ready to launch the rocket. But what was he planning to do with it? Fly back home? Destroy Tilted? Your guess is as good as mine. On June 16th, shopping carts were disabled yet again because of the mole people, and a skull has started to appear on the TVs around the island, seemingly a message from the visitor, as well as the monitor at the villain base showing a projection of the rocket like in the loading screen. June 19th, stink bombs were added to the game. They came in an epic rarity and worked very similar to the smoke grenade. When thrown, they would release a cloud of diarrhea fart into the air. This cloud would last for 9 seconds and anyone inside would take 5 damage every half second. The damage you would deal would also only chip away at health, so it was extra deadly. The cloud was very similar to the smoke grenade, but it wasn't dark enough to fully hide it. The stink grenade was a pretty decent utility item to get players to come out of hiding, and even did good damage. The rocket launcher had its reload time increased by about half a second because it was still absolutely dominant.
We also got a new LTM today, which was Final Fight Teams of 20. This was just like Teams of 20, except now when the third storm circle closes, the storm completely stops and 3 minute timer starts. At the end, the team with the most players wins, and if multiple teams tie, they can each get a victory royale. This inevitably led to everyone camping, so this mode wasn't too well received. This mode would last until June 27th. On June 20th, shopping carts returned, but then got disabled shortly after because, you guessed it, they didn't fix the under the map clutch again. But they would later return fixed on June 26th. The next day on June 27th, version 4.5 released bringing the new dual pistols. They came in an epic and legendary rarity and used medium ammo. They were a pair of pistols, which when used would do a burst of two shots. These looked just like the basic pistol, but worked completely differently. They had more damage and a slower fire rate. The dual pistols were a force to be reckoned with, but the accuracy was restricted to closer ranges. The tactical and suppressed SMG both had a damage increase of 2 and increased accuracy, making SMGs more of a viable option now, especially since the shotgun meta got heavily nerfed. And the grenade launcher now shoots fireworks for the 4th of July, which was just a cosmetic change. Going on to map changes now, vegetation is continuing to grow at Dusty Divot, and mushrooms can now spawn there as well. The research lab has been completely deserted now, since the visitor escaped. At Tilted Towers, the construction of a new building has started replacing the one that got destroyed by the meteor. The Risky Reels Hop Rock Convoy has now left Anarchy Acres and has arrived at Pleasant Park. And there is a new set of movies there, White Lion, The Omega Crusher, and TV Dreams. The crater west of the motel has been completely filled and a hop rock convoy has left and is now at Haunted Hills. As well as the crater by Fatal Fields being completely filled in and the convoy leaving the bridge and arriving at Greasy Grove. The crater at the prison is also fully patched up as well as the crater over by Retail Row being completely filled in and a convoy has left and is just outside the POI. And in Retail Row a detective agency has opened up. At the villain base, the visitor has made some modifications on the rocket probably with the hop rocks and he is now blaring a warning siren that can be heard in game. As well as the TVs displaying a 3 day timer. The LTMs added this update were Final Fight Teams of 12 and Playground. Final Fight came back this time but now there are Teams of 12 and I don't know anyone who is asking for this. And the other LTM we got was Playground. Playground was where you could just screw around and do anything. Make racetracks, have an epic fight with your friends, make a giant dick. The world was your oyster. Eh, for only an hour. You would have 55 minutes, and then the storm would take 5 minutes to close. So you were on a pretty strict time limit. In this mode, player respawn was on, materials gathered were multiplied by 10, there was 100% chest and ammo box spawn rate, and 100 llamas would spawn on the island. So you really had the ability to do anything. Just too bad it got disabled right after release. So you were kinda just stuck with Final Fight until June 29th, which it then promptly got replaced by 50v50v3, which would stay as a permanent addition. On June 30th, the countdown was going to expire and everyone was told to be in game for the first live event ever. The visitor was going to launch the rocket. An hour before launch, the villain base had a yellow pillar of light over it, and then it was time. First, the rocket took lift off. The boosters engaged, but one fell off the rocket onto the island, and the rocket then disappeared into space. Then the visitor said, He started coming back down to the island and targeted a laser toward Tilted. But right before impact, the rocket went through some kind of portal, and then a portal above Moisty Meyer appeared and the rocket came back out flying around the map before entering another portal above Greasy. A portal by Tilted then appeared and the rocket flew out and entered one massive portal in the sky, leaving a massive crack. And that was it for the event. 
but still, there's a lot to unpack with this. First of all, what was the visitor's goal? So we know that the visitor upgraded the rocket to most likely use these rifts, and the government was most likely helping him because they brought a ton of hop rocks to him. So what I believe is that the visitor was trying to destroy or rift away the zero point, based on his one line of dialogue he said during the event. We know that the zero point's location was later revealed to be at Loot Lake, so he either mistook the coordinates, or the government sabotaged him which led him to almost hit Tilted instead, where he then created a ton of rifts to stop it from happening. So is it a stretch to say that the events that unfolded were a complete mistake by the visitor, or maybe it was completely intentional, who knows? But still, this live event was amazing and no other game had done anything like it before, but it didn't come without its own share of problems. The main issue being that the event happened in a regular match. While most people decided to team up just for this once to see the spectacle, there were definitely some immoral human beings out there. Most notably, someone destroyed a viewing platform with 48 people on it, which gave one guy the record of most kills in a match ever, still to this day I believe. But even then, with all these issues, this was an incredible one-time experience. And after the blast off event, a few map changes were noticed in-game. Firstly, the giant crack in the sky is still there and would continue to grow over the course of the season. The booster that fell off the rocket landed in Anarchy Acres, and a rift is starting to form in front of the main cabin in Lonely Lodge. A day later, on July 1st, the rift at Lonely Lodge opened up and took the sign leaving the rift open, and over at the motel, another rift is starting to form. On July 2nd, Playground was now playable again and would stay as a permanent game mode, as well as the blockbuster contest started today. You could create a superhero film in-game, and then submit it to Fortnite, the deadline being July 11th. Top winners would receive V-Bucks, and the best one would be played at Risky Reels in the future. Over at Lonely Lodge, the rift that took the sign has now disappeared. The rift at the motel has now opened up and taken the sign, and a new rift is starting to form at the Pizza Pit restaurant in Tomato Town. On July 3rd, a patch update released bringing the new drum gun. It came in an uncommon and rare rarity and used medium ammo. It was a hybrid weapon that had the power of an AR and the fire rate of an SMG. It worked great at medium range and it was a beast. To be honest, it was just a much better version of the LMG. It had higher damage, faster fire rate, faster reload time, less recoil, and it was easier to find. This thing completely outclassed the LMG and it was the spray weapon of choice. Up in the sky, the situation had begun to get worse as another crack had formed up there. The rift at the motel was closed, and the one at Tomato Town has opened up taking the tomato head with it. And over at Retail Row, another rift is forming in front of the Nam's grocery store. The next day on July 4th, the rift at Tomato Town has closed, and the one at Retail Row has opened taking the Nam sign. At Greasy Grove, a rift is now starting to form at the Durburger restaurant. On July 5th, the rift at Retail Row disappeared, and the one at Greasy Grove opened up taking the Durburger, and a rift is starting to form on a mountain in between Greasy Grove and Snobby Shores. The next day, on July 6th, we got the first couple of teasers. The rift on the mountain opened up, and instead of taking anything away, it brought in Anchor. Secondly, the Durburger that was rifted away was just found in the middle of a desert in California, kicking off a whole ARG. And if you don't know, an ARG is an alternate reality game. These are where you work with a community to solve interactive puzzles. At the Durburger, there was also a police car modeled like the one seen in game, and a sign reading, This site is unstable, beware of possible effects. At the site, a person would be out there that would hand anyone there a business card. On one side of the card, it read Agent 3678. The only thing substantial about this is that those numbers on a keypad would translate to Fort. On the other side is a phone number. I don't know if I should show this on YouTube, I don't know if it can be called still. Eh, screw it. The phone number is 712-380-4091, the area code being the actual start date for Season 5. When the number is called, the sound of riffs can be heard from the other side. The call when tracked down is from Ezr Ezerville? Ezerville, Iowa. I Ezra 
whatever. This may be a bit of a stretch, but on May 10th, 1879, a 455 pound meteor landed there, almost like the events of this season. The sound coming from the call when put into a spectrogram gave some kind of code I believe, but that's about as far as I looked into it. On July 7th, a rift started to form northeast of the prison, and the next day, a horse carriage was rifted in. On July 9th, five llamas had been spotted in Europe in these five countries. I apologize in advance if I completely botch these names. The llamas were found in London, England, Barcelona, Spain, Cologne, Germany, Warsaw, Poland, and Cannes, France. Cannes? I don't know. These didn't have any significance to the ARG, so they were probably just there for funsies. Today, a rift has started to form in Moisty Mire, as well as the first proper teaser for Season 5 releasing, showing some kind of Japanese mask. On July 10th, the rift in Moisty Mire brought in an animal skeleton, and the second teaser image released showing a viking axe. July 11th, the final teaser released with the slogan of Season 5, Worlds Collide. And the last few hours before the season ended, a third crack in the sky had appeared. But that's it for Season 4. It lasted for 72 days and was yet another banger of a season. The new items this season were really fun and unique, especially the shopping cart bringing vehicles to the game. We also got constant map changes each update, which is one of my favorite parts of the season. Logging on each update just to see what has changed around the map is always just such a delight. The storyline got really interesting this season and the live event was a blast, no pun intended. The only thing really lacking this season was the battle pass, but that's kind of subjective. Season 4 is my definition of Fortnite nostalgia, and is still one of my favorite seasons to this day. But I'd like to know your guys' opinions on this season. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching. And I'm going to end the video now.